ஆச்சாமி துத்தியம் பி அஹங் பந்த தி சரணேன சக பஞ்சீலாச்சாமி ததியம்பி அஹங் பந்த தி சரணேன சக பஞ்சீலாச்சாமி நமோ தகவது அரஹத்து சம்மாசம்புதச 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 ாமிபுங்கி ாமிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதிபாதி
because what is the character of an untrue man? Here, an untrue man who has gone forth from an aristocratic family considers thus, I have gone forth from an aristocratic family, but these other bhikkhus have not gone forth from an aristocratic families. So he lauds himself and disparages others because of his aristocratic family. This is the character of an untrue man. But a true man considers that thus, it is not because of one's aristocratic family that states of greed, hatred, or delusion are destroyed, even though someone may not have gone forth from an aristocratic family. Yet if he has entered upon the way that accords with the Dhamma, entered upon the proper way, and conducts himself according to the Dhamma, he should be honored for that. He should be praised for that. So putting the practice of the way first, he neither lauds himself nor disparages others because of his aristocratic family. This is the character of a true man. Moreover, an untrue man who has gone forth from a great family, from a wealthy family, from an influential family, considers thus. I have gone forth from an influential family. But these other bhikkhus have not gone forth from, an, from, from influential families. So he loves himself and disparages others because of his influential family. This true it is true is a character of an untrue man. But a true man considers thus. It is not because of one's influential family that states of greed, hatred, or delusion are destroyed. Even though someone may not have gone forth from an influential family, yet he may, he, if he has entered upon the way that accords with the Dharma, entered upon the proper way, and conducts himself according to the Dharma, he should be honored for that, he should be praised for that. So putting the practice of the way first, he neither lords himself nor disparages others, because of his influential family. This too is the character of a true man. Moreover, an untrue man who is well known and famous considers thus, I am well known and famous, but these other bhikkhus are unknown and of no account. So he lords himself and disparages others because of his renown. This too is the character of an untrue man. But a true man considers thus, it is not because of one's renown that states of greed, hatred or delusion are destroyed. Even though someone may not be well known and famous, yet if he has entered upon the way that accords with the Dharma, entered upon the proper way and conducts himself according to the Dharma, he should be honoured for that, he should be praised for that. So. Putting the practice of the way first, he neither lords himself nor disparages others because of his renown. This too is the character of a true man. So the first thing to note is the emphasis on these three things, greed, hatred, and delusion. These, if you're not clear, these are, are probably the most succinct way of describing unwholesomeness. It's the core of unwholesomeness. Loba, dosa, and moha. So the the most common way of use, of describing these is just loba. The words loba, dosa, and moha. Sometimes raga is used or that sort of thing. So dosa, I, I don't know that hatred is the best. Anger is maybe better because well, hatred is just one flavor of anger. Anger is probably the more general way of of describing it, but. Um, I mean, it's quite simply, they're the opposites, right? Greed is the attraction to something. Anger is the aversion to something. And the, the salient quality is what we call patiga, which means aversion. And then delusion. Uh, delusion is literally described or translated as uh, like cloudiness, or you can think of it as like a distorted distortion as well, but it encompasses any kind of misunderstanding or uh, lack of understanding as well. And it's the root which allows for greed and, ang and anger to arise. 
but these three are the three roots. Those of you who are studying Abhidhamma have probably already got, gotten into this. Uh, another thing here is entered upon the way might seem a little bit strange. I don't think that's quite the best way to translate it. Uh, the word is patipanna, which is a very common word in in the Buddhist teaching that we usually just translate as practice. You see at the end he says, so putting the practice of the way first. There's no word that means way here. It's just putting practice first. Yeah, I mean, it's just pedantic. It, putting the practice of the way is fine, but just to make it clear to you that the Buddha is just using the word practice here. One who, and the first one is interesting because it's Dhamma Nub Dhamma Patipanna, which uh, it takes a little bit of explaining to to understand because it uses the word Dhamma twice. It means the practice of the Dhamma uh, by following the Dhamma, or the practice of the Dhamma which leads to the Dhamma. That's why he, he translates it here as accords with the Dhamma, Anu Dhamma. And we had this last week as well, Anu Dhamma means according to the Dhamma. Uh, but the, the explanation is that it means the practice of the uh, the practice of the qualities of Dhamma, like sila, samadhi, and banya, or the practice of the preliminary path, which is the sila, samadhi, and banya, to the development of uh, seeing clearly, for the purpose of realizing the Dhamma, which that Dhamma refers to the lokutra Dhamma, Nibbana. So basically the practice of Vipassana, just to realize Nibbana, if you want to put it succinctly. But there is two two different meanings of the word Dhamma, as it's explained. Oh, yes, Rather crazy. than like entered on the way accords with that, it's practicing, practicing the Dhamma to realize the Dhamma, or quite literally something like practicing the Dhamma in line with the Dhamma. And then the second one, entered upon the proper way, really just means rightly practice. Samiji Patipanna. Samiji means proper. So is conceit a form of, of greed? No, conceit is delusion. I, I thought you said that conceit is a form of greed. No. no. But how about wanting to be influential or famous like the untrue person in the Sutta? Wanting is greed. Conceit, like all other forms of delusion, is very influential in giving rise to greed and anger. I mean, they work together. It can go the other way as well. Greed can increase your conceit, that sort of thing. Um. But I remember you sharing a Facebook post where Ajahn Tong is saying, like, don't brag, protect the goodness. Like, is that is that um, exactly how it is? Like, if you don't brag, you protect something with that? Or well, if you brag, the, the, an you interesting don't. thing about what he said is that I, if you brag about practicing the Dhamma, the bragging is no longer practicing the Dhamma. You're craving you know, some kind of appreciation, so you 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 boast, hey, I, hey, I'm practicing the Dhamma. You're no longer practicing the Dhamma. You've 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 lost it by by talking That's about. It. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not to say that you can't talk about it, but you have to be careful about your mind. And when is one disparaging others? What do you mean? Uh, is it when they actually have qualities, but you disparage them? Or... Well, I, I not, don't quite understand the question. Disparaging, do you understand what the word it's... means? I mean, when you, when you say bad yeah. things about people or, or criticize them, put someone down. Oh, that, that person's no good. That well, person's less than me. Yeah. I'm 
speaking out from the sutta, so putting the practice, uh, he neither louds himself nor disparages others because of his renown. Right, well, it's it's so just it's, referring back to where he said to himself, uh, where up at the top it says, these other bhikkhus have not gone forth from influential families. That's a form of disparagement. A monk might think another monk is just coming from a peasant family, he's not even a high caste, so he might uh, disparage him based on that. It's related, I mean, the, the words can be used in different ways, but here it's related to conceit. Uh, he's, mm -hmm. he's lauding himself, means he's praising himself. He thinks thinking himself better than others and thinking others worse than him. He's disparaging them. He said, Poof, these people are less than me. These first few probably seem a little bit um, obvious. I mean, I think I think we would be surprised to hear that that many people interested in the Dhamma would be in this category. It does happen, actually. There there are groups of monastics who refuse to ordain people outside of a certain caste, which, well, they should certainly read this sutta, <laughs> or there's many suttas, but. Uh, there, there's. It was it was a thing in 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 India. I mean, it still is to some extent where people look look upon themselves highly because of their birth and that sort of thing. I think some Nikayas in Sri Lanka also consider. Uh, That's what know, I was thinking. Of. Caste. <laughs> it's only in Sri Lanka that I know of. Also, I think it has to do with, uh, like, you don't want just beggars to come and join just for the food. I mean, just have to check whether somebody's really interested. So maybe that's a factor. Yeah, but not by their birth. And that's not really fair, because a beggar could be uh, a good practitioner. Can't just go by their past, even. If someone was a beggar and wants to become a monk, that shouldn't immediately be a reason to dis disqualify them. Though it does happen that people join for the wrong reasons. So you do have to consider carefully. But isn't the case that uh, um, a person who is born in a, a higher caste might um, take the robe for the wrong reason as well? And they, yeah. Some, yeah, for example, some... if you if you want to uh, uh, like uh, certain temples have like very so much power when it comes to politics, like uh, very influential uh, in Sri Lanka. So maybe if you want to jo become a head monk, uh, become the head monk in that temple, maybe you will you would. Uh, encourage your, one of your sons to become ordained and get the, that influence. Okay, um, verse um, 8. Uh, Moreover, an untrue man who gains robes, arms, food, resting places, and requisites of medicine considers thus, I gain robes, Alms food, resting places, and requisites of medicine, but these other bhikkhus do not gain these things. So he lords himself and disparages others because of gain. This too is the character of an untrue man. But a true man considers thus, it is not because of gain that states of greed, hatred, or delusion are destroyed. Even though someone has no gain, yet if he has entered upon the way that accords with the Dhamma, entered upon the proper way and conducts himself according to the Dhamma, he should be honoured for that, he should be praised for that. So, putting the practice of the way first, he neither loads himself nor disparages others because of gain. This too is the character of a true man. Moreover, an untrue man who is learned, who is expert in the dis discipline, who is preacher of, of the Dhamma, who is a forest dweller, who is a refu refuser and wearer, an half food eater, a tree root dweller, a charnel ground dweller, an open air dweller, a continual sitter, 
and any bed dweller, an open air dweller, a continual sitter, and any bed user, a one session eater considered thus. I am a one session eater, but these other beacons are not one session eater, so he loads himself and disperses others because of his being a one session eater. This too is the character of untrue man. But a true man considers thus. It is not because of being an, a one session eater that stages, states of greed, hatred, or delusion are destroyed. Even though someone may not be a one session eater, yet if he has entered upon the way that accords with the Dhamma, entered upon the proper way, and conducts himself according to the Dhamma, he should be honored for that, he should be praised for that. So putting the practice of the way first, he neither lauds himself nor disparages others because of his being a one session eater. This too is the character of a true man. Here we see this is sort of, it's gone in stages. The first section was very trivial things. This is a little more serious because this is much more common that someone who has learned, for example, someone who has learned much of the Buddhist teaching might become proud. Someone who preaches the Dhamma, who has people praising their, their ability to, to preach and to teach. Uh, might become quite proud. And then you have all these, uh, the Dutangas, the ascetic practices. This is probably a little less common, I think, in practice. People who practice these are, are, are a little, usually, I would like to think beyond sort of looking for praise and doing them. In fact, there's, but I, mean, I suppose it's not true. Someone could be doing it just for show, right? But there are there are teachings on these things that a real practitioner would often hide the fact, like deliberately try and hide the fact that they were keeping these. So there's a story of one monk who was doing nesajika, meaning he were, he would, uh, where it's, he translated, translates it here as a continual sitter, but um, I thought it just meant never, not lying down. Nesajikanga. And he one time had to stay in a, in a room with another monk, and the other monk lay down and went to sleep, and the monk who was keeping Nesajika sat in the dark and uh, just sat in meditation throughout the night. And about in, halfway through the night, in the middle of the night, the monk who was lying down uh, woke up, and he saw that the other monk was still sitting. And he said, are you practicing Nesajika? And the other monks just immediately lay down and went to sleep. So he broke his Nesajika so that he wouldn't have to brag about it. Mm. Bante, if we have unusual experiences during meditation, should we avoid talk to talk about them because it's bragging? Well, it's not bragging to say something. It's bragging if you're looking for people to praise you for it. Wonder, but was it, it, it can be it can be problematic for other reasons because it can lead people on, lead people to expect things from their practice. Talking about your experiences in practice um, is hit or miss. I wouldn't be too keen on telling people about what happens when you meditate. It doesn't really it often sets them up for expectation and that sort of thing. But isn't this a good thing to make people want to meditate? You can't make people want to meditate. They have to want to do it themselves. Or is it wrong to make them want to meditate for certain experiences? If you want to make someone medit if you want to make someone want to meditate, then yeah, you're not doing the right thing. Okay. About the story you told, Bante, was that wise for that monk to interrupt his practice? I'm not sure exactly how it happened. I don't think that's an issue. I mean, maybe it is, but the, the real story was the fact that the monk was uh, intent upon hiding the fact that he was keeping Nesachika, so he, even to the extent that he broke it, 
instead of having to admit that he was he was keeping it he lay down he could have continued to be an example uh, to inspire others without bragging right it, but it's it's mentioned as an example of of well a, a fewness of which is a picture not want people to praise you for it but bante isn't that also a form of greed if uh, i know it depends on the person but uh, for example as soon as i heard that people try to uh, avoid um, that others know that you practice these things i thought oh wow that, that's so noble <laughs> but at the same time i had this idea that i have to do this too because it's respectable or something like that so that felt greedy mm -hmm. Uh, well, no feeling inspired is, I think, valuable. Okay. It's not to say you have to hide these things, but it's an interesting story. It's it's uh, considered praiseworthy what this monk did. You, you, it's it's important not to take anything too literally. Like, oh, this monk did like that, so that's the only way, and I have to do it that way. And the, that's not what the story is saying. It's just. Pointing out as an example, this is what uh, a sapurisa would do. Sometimes uh, people uh, who like uh, try to mingle with other people, ordinary people, like if you are keeping to the five precepts, you uh, go to a party with friends and they encourage you to drink. And sometimes people feel shy to say that they are keeping to the precepts. I think uh, it's okay to say. Just to inspire, or at least. Well, it can often. It, it it's just quite often a, a source of pride, where you tell people, mm -hmm. "I don't, I don't drink alcohol. I'm better than those people who drink alcohol." Which honestly is kind of true, <laughs> because that is a real big deal, but. Just because something's true doesn't mean you feeling proud about it is is right. Of course, doesn't it doesn't justify pride by any means. And then the worst thing happens that uh, they get pressured into doing it because they can't. They are shy to reveal that <laughs> they are keeping right. The right. Yeah. Don't follow the example of that monk in this instance. In instances where it's against true morality, then. You don't just say, oh, I'll hide the fact that I'm keeping the five precepts so I'm not proud, and I'll hide it by drinking alcohol. Don't do that. Can it be done to the case that in that story, uh, the monk wouldn't have had the quality of mind to continue the um, the meditation and for for the quality of mind of his mind, uh, it was better to just lay down. Um, I think it was just a matter of not wanting to appear, not wanting to, not wanting to give, uh, to fall prey to conceit. Yeah, maybe you. he felt like he, maybe he felt like he was conceited, and so he didn't want to have people praising him. But it can also be that an arahant might do that as well. Just because it's it's uh, appropriate to do the thing that when 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 you when someone puts you in a position to brag, asking, "Is it true that you do this?" Then even an arahant, I think, could could be justified or could be inclined to do the right thing and. Uh, it's not even so much as an example, but just because it's the right thing to do to to not uh, affirm something good about yourself, to not affirm that you're praiseworthy quality of humility. I have a question. Um, is it the bragging that a meditator can be an untrue man, or he uh, he has already become an untrue man, and that's why? He can brag. Well, both, I would say. 
more more so the fact that a person who is not sapurisa. Again, true man, untrue man is not the best translation here. True is not not the proper adjective. Uh, though Purisa does mean man, it's obviously not just talking about men, uh, but it's just good, really. Um, but mostly it's the fact that if you're not Sapurisa, you're going, it's a sign of that. When you see someone bragging, you say, oh, that's a sign. But that being said, bragging makes you makes it worse. Bragging reinforces the tendency to brag. So the meditation does not purify that meditator. Well, sure. Meditation, of course. Isn't that unfortunate that the meditator become so big, a teacher or some someone um, so highly honorable, and he brags and he just gives up everything, he becomes an untrue man? Um, that can happen, yeah. But that can happen with anything that distracts you from the practice. It it also doesn't necessarily have to happen. You, you can continue to practice doing other things as well. I see. Okay. Thanks. But yeah, I mean, best is to first practice yourself. If you haven't practiced yourself, don't, don't go into teaching. As long as you are not enlightened, you can fall back to be, being an untrue man or... As a Purisha, false man, bad person. So even yeah. go ahead. Okay. Um. So even an um up to Anagani stage, one can be an Asa Purisha, right? No, no, no. But they can so still this have and see. The so Sotapanna is not uh, called uh, Asa Purisha. Oh, I thought it's just about being conceited about something. Uh, in regards to alcohol, alcohol, um, I'm almost certainly wrong, but I keep having this feeling that when we don't want those mental states that alcohol gives us, it's a form of aversion. What's a form of aversion? Not wanting those mental states that alcohol gives you. Uh, no, it's a wisdom. Because you identify that they are no, no good. For example, if... <laughs> uh, not, not wanting to eat grass because you know that you cannot digest and they are not food for you. Not wanting to eat trash, not wanting to eat soil. <laughs> Because you know that they are not good for you. I mean, There's a difference just... between not wanting and wanting not. If you want not to, then that's attachment. But they're just words. You have to study the Abhidhamma, and then you can know that there is... Uh, whether there is patiga or not patiga, that's whether there is a person not about what you say about it. It's not about the words you use. It's about what's happening in the mind at that moment. So if there's patika, then then, then it's anger-based. If there's not patika, then it's not. And yeah, you can of course be get angry. If someone offers you alcohol, you can get angry at them. And if, uh, if you look at some food, for example, and sense that it has alcohol in it, you might get afraid, and that's unwholesome. That fear is anger-based. So absolutely, keeping the precepts can be a source of defilement, just like anything else. It's, it's, not, it's not a problem with the precepts, it's your state of mind. I mean, if somebody got drunk and just noted, the, just said drunkenness, drunkenness, or unclarity, unclarity, wouldn't that be a wholesome state of mind? If you think someone can be can be mindful when they're drunk, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, I don't want to be the David's advocate, so it's okay. 
I had a student once who tried alcohol after doing meditation. It's, he did some meditation for the first time, and then he went and drank alcohol. And he told me, he said that he just couldn't be mindful at all, even after one drink. It just he really noticed. Well, maybe not at all, but he noticed how uh, hard it was, or how, what an, a strong effect it had. Alcohol and and that sort of thing is the and is antithetical to mindfulness practice, which is why it's such an important one. Even the precept has the wordings that leads to being intoxicated and unmindful. Right, Bhante? Machu Pama. Pama. Pamada. Pamada is basically being unmindful, yeah. Someone asked a question on Discord recently about uh, sleeping sleeping medication and I think some sleeping medication actually is narcotic and you should be wary of taking it. But it may very well be valid to consider breaking the fifth precept, depending on what it has in it. I think now I'm really being the Davis advocate, but what about the narcotics that give you states similar to those that meditation gives you? I don't know why you think being the devil's advocate will in, in, endear you to anyone here. No devils, no, I, no devils allowed here. Yeah, I was just curious. Sorry. Ah, well, that's a good sign that your question is not valid when you say, I'm just curious. Because that's a, not generally a good reason to ask questions. You should not curious, curious. So, but yeah. I, I have I have a question. I think you just mentioned about uh, pain medication, right? Uh, so, how about like Tylenol and the, the like, you know, other kinds of uh, pain medication? To like, is it? No, it's not about that? it's not about it. It its ability to to relieve pain. It's that these some medications actually have narcotics in them that that make you intoxicated. Okay, but we won't know um, that, right? <laughs> we, we, well, you may have to uh, investigate. I don't know. I've I've just heard that some of them, like they tell you, you're not supposed to drive. Uh, that's not a big deal, but some of them actually do. I think intoxicate. Yeah, there, there are all kinds of uh, mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, counter, you know, under counter med medications to relieve a pain, right? So. Uh, we won't like know that. Percocets. Right? My my father was on Percocets, and he was definitely intoxicated. That's just a painkiller. So, Bante, uh, when you use uh, sleeping pills, and the intention is actually to just sleep, like why would that be breaking the precept? But. It's not about your intention or about the pill. It's about what's in it. If it's something that intoxicates the mind, then it's breaking the pressure. It makes yeah. you unable to be mindful. People who drink also drink to have a good time with their friends. Yeah, or drink to fall asleep. Actually, I'm not sure about that one, but uh, some people yeah, doing... I mean, honestly, the whole idea of taking a drug to fall asleep is really a bad idea in the first place just on so many levels, it's not going to be a long-term solution. And it's a shame because it's become quite common even to use natural mm -hmm. sources. Melatonin, is that one that people use to fall asleep? I mean, things that are quite natural and probably harmless, uh, still a really bad idea because it, infor it reinforces the need to sleep, the fear of not sleeping. And it just it's this obsession that we have with sleep as some some higher power and it's not really and it's a shame because if you could learn to be mindful even lying awake you would become so much happier and more peaceful I would imagine it would be a benefit to a meditator if you don't uh, fall asleep at night seriously I mean that's the revolution is that's the the real awakening that's so liberating for people who are insomniacs that uh, it's the opposite of what you thought. 
thought you thought you were in trouble because you weren't sleeping, and in fact, it's an opportunity. I am surprised uh, by people are trying to fall asleep. I personally just can't stay awake after a <laughs> certain time. It's a it's a big problem for many people in in the in the Western world. I don't know about other cultures, but. In America, Canada, it's uh, we had a student. We had two students recently, and one of them. I don't know if I'm calling anybody out. I won't name names. Uh, one of them uh, didn't hear, uh, hear the rules or didn't understand the rules uh, where you, we require meditators to sleep no more than six hours. So he was sleeping eight hours uh, every night, and had trouble finishing the course as a result. And the other one was keeping the rules, but was very afraid. Was very afraid of not sleep, of sleeping less. She got into more intensive practice, and and they both came out of it, I think, appreciating on a much deeper level how valuable it could be. But there's such a strong indoctrination of the need for a certain a number of hours of sleep, and how you become sleep deprived, which I mean, it's, it's valid because sleep. Um, allows all of the stress and distress of the day to settle, to, to go away. So if you had a lot of stress during the day, sleep is going to help with that. I mean, there's other benefits as well, I, I think. But if you don't have that sort of distress, if on the other hand you are uh, developing positive states, those two are also going to go away absolutely when you sleep. So it's kind of, on some level, a balancing. It's falling asleep is it brings you back to a neutral state, not in a good way, because it it just does away with any powerful states, whether they be good or bad. And to some extent, I mean that's obviously most likely simplifying what sleep does, but practically speaking, that's how it appears. You can see for yourself that, well, when you are stressed out during the day, sleep to some extent, helps with that. But on the other hand, when you've been meditating all day, sleep reduces the benefits. And when you wake up, you have to kind of start over. We made that meditation can oh. help with falling asleep. It's, uh, I think, the first out of the 11 benefits. Sleeping yeah, but is mindfulness good. is better. You never get better than yeah. mindfulness. Metta is, is, yeah, metta in general, being a loving, a kind, friendly person is going to help you with your sleep, of course. But that's more of a kind of a basic practice. It's the kind of one of the many reasons why metta, why friendliness is just generally a good way to be. But practically speaking, if you if you have, are suffering from insomnia, the best cure is mindfulness. It's It's almost immediate. How it changes your your attitude towards sleep. Is it true that advanced meditators get so much peace and attention that they don't require sleep at all? Here we have the example: the continual sitter, the nesachika. Yeah. It's never never lying um, down, not at night, not in day. And when I sit um, the first course uh, of intensive practice, I I didn't sleep and I sleep maybe a couple of hours at night. And um, I was not uh, an expert. I just started. So I think that uh, when you do intensive uh, retreats, this one is likely to happen. And uh, it was, um, it was, uh, I, I couldn't, think that it was possible to be so um, not being tired even though he, I didn't sleep. So it was something like uh, very powerful, I think. Oh, Bante, about meditation, should we be aware of awareness itself when we meditate? I mean, is it included in the Satipatthana? You could not know it, knowing. It's included in the Satipatthana. So paragraph 21. Yes. More, 
Moreover, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome state, an untrue man enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, which rapture and pleasure born from seclusion. He considers it thus, I have gained the attainment of the first jhana, but these other bhikkhus have not gained the attainment of the first jhana. So he louds himself and disparages all others because of his attainment of the first jhana. This too is the character of an untrue man. A true man considers thus. Non-identification, even with the attainment of the first jhana, has been declared by the Blessed One. For in whatever way they conceive, the fact is ever other than that. So putting non-identification first, he neither lauds himself nor disparages others because of his attainment of the first jhana. This too is the character of a true man. So, this is, I think, a difficult passage. Mikabodhi has a long note about it. Uh, my my understanding is the gist of it is actually kind of important, um, and I don't I, I'm not sure I agree with. It. I mean, he disagrees with the commentary, which is always a bit of a, a bit suspicious. He may be right, but if we listen to the commentary, uh, I, I think the, the the basic idea is that. The um, the jhanas often involve a fixation on a concept, right? We are familiar with this kind of jhana. And as a result, whatever you are focused on is not enough to allow you to see clearly because it's not really related to reality and the jhanas so so i i get the sense that the, he's saying i don't want to put words into the buddha's mouth of course but there's the idea here of uh, the jhanas being to some extent conceptual and as a result there's the potential always for making more of things or or it's kind of inherent in the fixation on a single object i, mean, I guess the, basically the saying that the, the saying is what say he's saying is that the jhanas themselves are are not enough they're more of a tool to be used as a means of focusing your attention on reality because of the strength that they give then this is why the commentary says you leave the jhana technically because your focus is no longer on the single object that you focus on the qualities of the jhana and on your state of experience instead of the jhana yeah. the point point being that you go beyond it so when you're when you're in the jhanas you he said that you don't even know that you are in the jhanas. It is after coming out of the jhana whether you uh, can uh, use it uh, to develop a person or build some uh, wrong views on, upon it. Uh, I don't think that's true, but um, I guess maybe some of the higher jhanas, maybe. But uh, at least the first one with Vitaka and Vichara. And, but I, I still think you know. You, you don't know in the sense of the thought not arising. The thought wouldn't arise, I guess, in the higher jhanas. But there is an awareness of it, for sure. I have a quick question about the jhanas. Is it um, that one is experiences first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana, and then cessation? Like, where does cessation come uh, with regards to... Jhanas, jhana sages. So this is again the the uh, sort of um, what do you call it? maybe the full practice that the Buddha is talking about. This is the practice for the nawa. What's the word? What's the word? There's the nine attainments. 
the eight attainments, and then the ninth is Nibbana. No, no, no. Nava means nine. Um, Nava Samapati, maybe I'm not sure. There's Atta Samap. How does the anyway? Uh, there, there's this is this is a specific way of practicing. This is like the way the Buddha practiced and the way uh, Arahants practice, but. You do have to understand the, the distinction between the two types of practice, because at the end he's going to talk about practice to become free from the taints, and you have he doesn't mention it, so you have to understand that it is a distinct practice. But but it's only in this practice that you go through all the jhanas first, and then come out of them and see impermanent suffering, non-self, and see nibbana. Thank you, Bhante. I mean, the, 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 um, the, he, do, he doesn't go into it here mostly because that's not the subject of the sutta. The subject is to point out that all of these states, all the way up to the very highest possible jhana, are still not something to be proud of. I mean, obviously, but they're they're still not. They're still they're still have, leave room for the potential for greed, anger, and delusion to arise. Not during them, but after. They still are not enough to cut it off. The, the potential to arise, uh, uh, greed, uh, aversion, and delusion that's coming out of jhana, right? Yes. After. Okay. Yeah, during the jhana, there's, there's no potential, right? During the jhana. No. No, but they don't actually cut it off. So when you come out, it can all come back. But uh, for the arans, that's not possible, right? For... Well, but the arans has nothing to do with the jhanas. It's. Something else. That's the point. Being an arahant doesn't have anything directly to do with entering into these jhanas that are being referred to. Um, as I understood Julie's question, uh, wasn't wasn't it that he she asked that uh, how the jhanas relate to cessation, and uh, isn't the answer? To that question, that uh, basically the the way or the strength of the mind uh, of how the three characteristics of reality, meaning impermanence, one of these, either impermanence, suffering, or non-self, is uh, seen um, or taken. So it can be taken as the strength of the level of the first jhana or the second jhana. So cessation could could happen uh, to e either through either. So it's the first, either through the first or either through the uh, second, and so. Well, but it doesn't happen through the jhanas. The jhanas are helpful and supportive, yeah. but. They don't cause you to see the three characteristics. So, so all I meant to say is I, there really isn't a relationship. The jhanas are supportive and I mean, very supportive, but it's a different practice to see the three characteristics. So it's better to use just the strength of the mind or... Well, in different ways, you, yeah, you can use the strength of mind of the jhanas and coming out of them, apply mm -hmm. your mind to vipassana, or you can just start with vipassana. Not, not, not saying that one is better, and to some extent it is better to do the jhanas. This, with, they, they give you this peace and this happiness prior to it, but it's more involved than generally. I mean, the, the jhanas are supposed to be done in seclusion, with a very peaceful environment and good conditions, it's usually well, it's often more feasible for, especially for people who are not living in the forest ordained, to just practice satipatthana. But yes, the jhanas provide strength. 
So Bante, you explained about uh, Vipassana Jhana and I'm re talking about Vipassana Jhana Nat. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's it's not really... No, uh, yeah, fair enough. That, that That's not probably what he's talking about here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, in, ca in our case, in our practice, we are practicing seeing reality as it is and the objects are changing and things like that. Yeah. So when we no, but actually, talk as, about... As the I jhanas, think about it, yeah, as I think about it, these could easily apply to Vipassana jhana as well. I mean, the Buddha has said this same same thing in different ways as well. He talks about this tree, uh, the the discourses on on the heartwood. Is that in the Majjhima Nikaya? I think we may not have gotten to it yet, but uh, or maybe we did. the The heartwood where someone experiences uh, the jhanas and feels like they've gained something, like they've found the heartwood. Or, and then it also says someone who gains insight. Someone starts to see clearly, and then they, they feel proud about that as well. So certainly even the, the, what we might call vipassana jhanas, one can feel proud of them, and it isn't enough yet. I would say it's a little more difficult to feel proud of them because of one's clarity of mind. The problem with the samatha jhanas is... Uh, he says here, an untrue man, uh, asapurisa, enters into the jhanas. That's that's important to 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 recognize that the Buddha is saying you don't have to be a very good person to enter into the jhanas, the samatha jhanas. The vipassana jhanas are a little. It's it's a little harder to be uh, bad because they're directly related to clarity. Wisdom. It doesn't fall under this first, second jhanas, right? They can. So, it, it depends how you understand them. The point is that jhana is just a word, and it appears to be applicable to different states. You can see that because most teachers who teach what we would call the samatha jhanas have different ideas and explanations about what they mean. It's... Uh, it's just, it shouldn't be like that. There should be a recognition that just because my jhanas are like this doesn't mean your jhanas are not jhanas. And this whole debate that you may not even, many of you may not even be aware of that people have about the jhanas is really, should not exist. There shouldn't be a debate. There should be a, a bit of a more of appreciation of the flexibility of of these states, considering they're just referring to qualities of mind, which could apply to different situations. But people, there's this reification, because a jhana is not a thing, right? Just like a self or a soul or a god is not a thing. It's just a name for a specific state. And no, the from, state from is really momentary. From, from uh, rising of a uh, chitta perspective, right? The first, the, it's the rupa or a chitta, right? The first jhana chitta. That, that, yeah, those that, are that, samatha yeah. jhanas. Those are only samatha jhanas. But the, in the Abhidhamma, it's referring to samatha. Samatha, okay. okay rupa that's... vachara, arupa vachara, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's also, it also talks about lokuttara jhana. Mm -hmm. and Magachitta is the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana, fifth jhana. Right, that, that yeah. But one advantage of uh, attaining the uh, Asta Samapati is that you can attain Nirodha once you complete your journey, or at least uh, once you attain uh, Anagabi state. Other than that, not a uh, lot of benefits. Paragraph 22. Moreover, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, an untrue man enters upon and abides in the second jhana. With the fading away as well of rapture, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, he enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana. Moreover, with the complete surmounting of perceptions of form, 
was the disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, an untrue man enters upon and abides in the base of infinite space. Moreover, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite, an untrue man enters upon and abides in the base of infinite consciousness. Moreover, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing, an untrue man enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. Moreover, by completely surmounting the base of nothingness, of nothingness, an untrue man enters upon and abides in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. He considers thus, I have gained the attainment of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. But these other bhikkhus have not gained the attainment of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. So he lends him, loads himself and disparages others because of this attainment of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. This too is the character of an untrue man. But the true man considers thus non-identification even with the attainment of the base of neither perception nor non-perception has been declared by the Blessed One. For in whatever way they conceive, the fact is that is ever other than that. So putting non-identification first, he neither loads himself nor disparages others because of this attainment of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. So too is the character of a true man. Moreover, by <clears throat> completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, a true man enters upon and abides in the cessation of perception and feeling and his stains are destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. This bhikkhu does not conceive anything. He does not conceive in regard to anything. He does not conceive in any way. That is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Hello, everyone. May I ask a question about the sutta, or is it too late? Thank you. No, no, no. Please ask questions. This is the time for questions. Uh, meditation questions, sutta questions, Buddhism-related questions. Okay, thank you. So my question is regarding line 26 where it says, moreover, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite, an untrue man enters upon and abides in the base of infinite consciousness. And so my question is, what about doing that makes the man untrue? What's untrue about doing that? Thank you. That's not what it says, though. It doesn't say that he's an untrue man because he does that. So, I think oh. you missed the dot, dot, dot at the end, etc. That means uh, you have to add the passage from the previous paragraphs. And then well, he... In either way, it, it doesn't ever say that he's an untrue man because he enters into those states. That's not what it's saying. Oh, I must have misunderstood. So the way I understood is uh, even an untrue man can do that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it says both uh, that an untrue man, uh, right? So that's why the ellipsis would have helped, because if you go back, you can see an untrue man enters into the first jhana, but a true man, uh, that doesn't say a true man enters into the jhanas, but obviously a a sapurisa can enter into them as well. Or, or, or okay. In other words, like it hasn't, it has. You don't have to be a sapurisa to do that. That's what I 
how I understood. It does, yeah, I mean, it, it does say at the end, so putting non-identification first, he neither allows or disparages it because of his attainment of the first jhana. And the same goes with all the others as well. I mean, Devadatta himself had the jhanas and even more than the jhanas, magical powers, which comes after attaining the jhanas. Um, respectfully, I don't quite, I still don't quite understand. Um, also, to be fair, I am new to reading suttas, so it might just be that I'm not sure how to actually interpret the way things are written. But I still don't quite understand why it says an untrue man. I'm, I just don't know how to interpret that in the context of that line and what it's try. What is it trying to say by by having that there? Trying to say that if you're not sapurisa, meaning true man, is maybe a little miss again, a little bit. Hard to understand. It, it it literally means something more like good person. Uh, if you're not a very good person, if you're meaning basically meaning if you have greed, anger, and delusion, but moreover you have kind of a bad state of mind, then uh, when you do enter into these higher states, it's possible that you might brag about them, feel conceited about them. That's what it's trying to say. Ah. Uh. Okay. Whereas Thank you very if, you, much. if you enter in, if you enter in with the right state of mind, uh, and if you're the sort of person, well, I mean, it's, it's more the Buddha telling you, don't be this sort of person, <laughs> don't don't be conceited. Basically, he's just trying to say, don't be wary that you might start to get conceited, and that makes you a that makes you not a. It's not. See, the use of the word support is a kind of. It's 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 more polite than saying a bad person or a good person. It's like a gentleman. It's like how we use the word gentleman in in English. It's that kind of connotation, but it literally does mean bad and good. Sapurisa. But you don't say bad, you say not good. So you have a good person and a not good person. Just to be polite and not call someone bad or evil, right? But that's literally right. what it means. It means there's it's a problem if you start to get conceited. That's what he's saying. So okay, that makes he's warning them. Warning them of the dangers of getting conceited and pointing out that you're not free from it just because you've entered into these higher states, and it doesn't it doesn't um, free you from the need to be concerned. And this is a common problem: people will enter into high states and then feel very conceited about them. Devadatta might be a good example of that. But and, there are other examples of people getting conceited, and perhaps. They might, um, which does happen a lot in spiritual practice, where they um, overestimate what they've accomplished, and maybe sure. he's he's looking at it and saying, um, again, the word untrue. I think I just I look too deeply into that. It might the way I understand it better. Again, true, true isn't isn't even used in the Pali. The word true is misleading because it just that is a very simple. Adjective that means good, right? I just, um, I, uh, Kai, I just want to I just want to tell you that uh, that paragraph is not finished. So the dot 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 means if you go into the paragraph twenty eight, so it continues with lots of uh, lots of more information. So it's uh, where he starts saying. He considers thus: I have gained the attainment of the uh, in in the in this case uh, in the twenty sixth uh, paragraph. It's I have gained the attainment of infinite consciousness, um, but these other bhikkhus have not gained the attainment of the infinite uh, base of infinite consciousness. So he lauds himself. So that's that's how it's the, you know. I think you are missing that part. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, that's yeah. what I was trying to say yeah. as well. Hmm. Yes, I know. And another thing was that, um, again, I need to restate. I am new to reading this, so 
by definitely like picking it, picking one part and reading it isn't uh, such an accurate way to go about it. But I was reading like confident uh, consciousness is infinite and knowing that there is nothing like from my perception, those are, those are very powerful uh, understandings to have. So I was thinking, isn't that something that should be useful? But of course, when you continue reading, you see why it says untrue. And now that I actually know what untrue means, it's all starting to make much more sense about the, the message mm -hmm. there. And for me, the message is that um, having, having understood this and sort of penetrated the reality in this way isn't something to be proud of. And it isn't um, maybe it isn't final. It's not all oh, because you've done this and it's so different than everything else that you've ever done and different from what other people may be doing. It's not, it's not the end. It's not reason to think that you're um, fully enlightened or something like that, but it's just, it's a step. It's important to realize this is just one more step. And so maybe, and I now interpret the untrue man as someone who is making progress, but gets fixated on one particular point in their progress. And they, they stop practicing in the way that they did or, or well, a couple, a couple of things. Um, first of all, it, it's not really a, a stepping stone in that way because there isn't anything from a Buddha. I mean, it seems profound, but it isn't actually related to the path to think that consciousness is infinite. It's still just a perception. It doesn't have any meaning or philosophical value to it. Um, the other thing is it's not so much about and I know this isn't what you mean but but to be to be clear um it it's better to say there is still the potential for being conceited about it and that and conceit is of course wrong than to say this isn't something to be conceited about but though that's that's normally how we say it but but it's because we think there are things or there's an implicit sense that there may be things worth being proud about, but pride itself is is not a good thing, and it's just more of a warning that this is still uh, allows for the potential of being conceited. The only one that's really worth something in an ultimate sense here is the last one, and you can see how different the description is. The Buddha doesn't say an untrue man or a, an asapurisa could be conceited about it because it's not possible, because it is a, a enough to free you from conceit. The bhikkhu does not have any conceit. Not possible that someone... It's, for the rest of them, it's still possible to be conceited, and it's something you should be wary of because that's a bad thing. Very... Thank you, Bhante. It's very interesting to to start to be absorbed in this and hear all the different perceptions and our ways of looking at things like that because viewing reality like that is just so different than what the world sort of is is doing and so to hear that uh like having the realization that there is nothing or that consciousness is infinite in the and looking at it from the Buddhist context and how the Buddha looks at it. And he's saying that it's, it's really just something very simple actually. And it's not, it's not even that isn't what you think it is. And it's just, it's just another, it's just another thing. And then when it says how the BQ doesn't conceive anything at all, it kind of indicates that the BQ is not even, uh, he's not even uh, being philosophical at all anymore. It's like there's another realm that maybe even transcends words where he's just, he's no one. Yeah. There's no one there yeah. to yeah. conceive. Yeah. It's, I mean, you don't even have to say there's another realm. It's kind of like giving up realms entirely or the idea of realms. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, that's, that's right. Thank you, Bonte. I very much appreciate um, your help alongside everyone else's help and understanding that. 
Anyone else has a question, maybe related to meditation, perhaps their practice? I have a question. Um, um, so I'm feeling really bad for this Andrew man. He has done so much, so many work, and then he becomes Andrew all of a sudden for a mistake. And is it fair to call him an Andrew man? What happens when he becomes Andrewman? Can he go back or is there something? Like if I hear a monk made a mistake, I wouldn't, I don't think that person is a Andrewman. I would think this is just a mistake. Uh, is there a way to go back? Is there a oath? Is there something else to do? Yeah, I don't think that's what it's saying. Again, same sort of thing. Uh, it's not that suddenly someone becomes an untrue, uh, an asapurisa because of one example. It's that someone who is asapurisa will praise themselves and disparage others. That's just their nature. So he continues doing that. Yeah. Well, it's someone. The only person who would do that is someone who had the potential to do it. You don't make mistakes. It's not like a, you slip and fall. It's uh, because of character. So he was untruth all along? Yes. Okay. Thanks. And untrue again, not, it's just such a... It's not In English, it just doesn't make have the same meaning. Untrue relates to either being fake or being a liar. And that's not, that's part of it, but that's not really, it's just saying someone who is not good. Okay. And is this true man and untrue man uh, are only for the men or is this a human being, anyone? Yeah, no, it, there's no gender involved. It's just, a, it's, again, it's just a term. It seems to have been a common thing to say, like gentleman. I see. Thank you. And, and and you do raise a good point that, that this isn't about a being. Of course, people can change, and the people don't actually exist. So it's more the Buddha saying, again, as a warning. He's just reminding the monks that if you feel conceited, you haven't been following my teachings, and you're not in a good way. This is a teaching. He's not He's not presenting theory or philosophy. He's hitting these monks. It may be that he's giving this talk because the monks listening were conceited in different ways. And so it's a means of pointing that out to them. Does he and have the option to go them. back? It's Sorry. not condemning them. It's saying mm -hmm. this is bad. That makes you, if, if, you're that, if you're doing that sort of thing, that makes you a sapurisa. And so that's a reason for you to stop doing that or to train yourself out of it because then you would be sapurisa. It's not condemning someone. It, 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 there's, you, have to, you have to let go of the idea of labels. Like, like if, if you call someone evil, um, it, it's not a condemnation. It's just a description of their qualities of mind at that time. That's how it should be seen. So when the Buddha said this is asapurisa, he wasn't condemning them. He was just describing them. And if they change, then he would describe them differently. I see. Bhante, does he have an option to go back to become a true man? I'm not sure you're listening to me. He, he doesn't exist in the first place. If I a see, person yes, is acting in a certain way, then you call uh -huh. them asapurisa. If they change and act in a new way, you might call them sapurisa. Can people change if that's what you're asking? Yeah, of course. People are always changing. I got you. Meditation, Thank you. meditation evokes change, good change. For example, Angulimala killed 999 people, but uh, then he became an Arad afterwards. So there's an example of extreme example going from one it's extreme to the other. It's just a description. You, you call someone Asapurisa because of their qualities and those qualities are of course always changing maybe getting worse maybe getting better 
have a question uh, regarding meditation and community sangha. Is that um, um, good for a local sangha to get together and meditate together? That's the first question, and I think the answer might be yes. I mean, good, good is a quality of mind. So even here with the Sapori side, it all has to do with the qualities of mind. So asking if something like that is good requires uh, a lot of qualifiers. So I mean, is so there a value then? Is there a value in people getting together and meditating together? There's only value in being mindful. So I mean, I'm kind of avoiding the question, but it's important that we really understand what would be the qualities, the factors that we have to think of when, when answering the question. And it only has to do with the states of mind of the people. What happens when people sit and meditate together? What are the qualities of mind that arise? And are they supportive of one's practice? One really supportive thing is the encouragement, the reminder. A problem with it is the distraction, because you're thinking about other people. You're often thinking about how you appear to other people. Um, it's a mixed bag, I would say. For many people, it's very helpful because they have low uh, conviction and capacity to practice on their own. So when in a group, it's much easier to find that conviction and be encouraged. But in the long term, it's probably a crutch because it's still going to be distracting and sort of an outward-looking exercise. I was going to say Satpurisa and uh, Satpurisa are just a way of uh, communicating as well. Like in real life, we call somebody like a politician. That's, he's corrupt. He's a bad man. Don't vote for him. No, he's no good. So that's an example. It doesn't mean he cannot change. But it's the way you communicate, like uh, pointing out somebody's not good. Yeah, I mean, it is important not to condemn and to... to... We do when we don't like someone, we, we create this person that we don't like and we forget that they probably have good qualities and their bad qualities might change and so on. And we're often blinded to the complexity. But, but Sunday, you had another question? Yes. Um, what would be, I mean, um, I don't know if I understand correctly what's the role of a local sangha for, for for us, I mean, um, what would be the the types of activities that um, would be more advantage um, ha would have more advantages than getting together and meditate or having, for instance, we had a a, a day long uh, retreat. That, oh, it's a good introduction be... for people. It's uh, meeting in person. The best use is to show someone else how to practice, show them how to do the walking and the sitting, and maybe the mindful prostration. By themselves. Okay. Well, show them how to do it. Yeah, you can do it with them, but it's really just an example. It's not going to be, shouldn't be their practice. They should be practicing on their own every day. But, yeah. you know, a big part of what we do is to encourage people to take up the at home course. So I think one really useful uh, um, activity is to help people to sign up for that, give them the instructions on how to do walk, show them how to walk, show them how to sit, and then uh, encourage them to sign up for the at-home course. And and meeting every week isn't a bad thing. If you want to meet every week with people, it can be encouraging. It's just... Um, it, it can be a bit misleading. I get the feeling that for some people that becomes their practice and they think they're practicing Buddhists because once a week they do a, a half an hour of sitting together or something. Yeah, uh, I just I just want to say about that that um, some people may not do a whole day meditation unless they get together with other people. So I think, I mean, there is some good. Uh, if they 
will not practice otherwise, you know, um, at home. Yeah, if you could do a whole day, that seems more valuable, doing a whole day of practice together rather than just a sure. one hour. Some groups I know meet just for an hour. Yeah, but the, they they met for a, for a whole day. That sounds more valuable. Yeah. Another question is, okay, if we meet and meditate together, is there a value in sharing afterwards the experience or is it better to talk about Dharma in general if we want that? I mean, now it's more reading... valuable to talk to a teacher one on one than to yeah. share in a group. Mm -hmm. You, you often get comparing, and and it's. I don't see a great benefit in sharing in a group. Actually, after Again, reading and talking, we we have people. a we have a system set up, and it's it's much more valuable if you're one on one with your teacher, getting direct instruction, asking questions without having to be distracted by other people in the room or anything like that. Okay, thank you, Banta. I mean, if you're talking about people who have done courses together, that might be more valuable. People who have already done an intensive course or two, then then sharing could have more value because everyone's a little bit experienced and there's less of a concern of um, giving at each other expectations or comparing or that sort of thing. Yeah, most but of still, the people... The, the sharing part may be not so important in... Sharing sharing insights and realizations might be might be valuable. Right, because the m majority of the people who attend they did like advanced courses, but it's only the two of us that um, practice in um, uh, in this specific uh, line. Although they started to do the walking meditation with us as well, so that there is a change. And they are reading the booklet as well. So, yeah. Thank you, Banda. Uh, in regards with persons not being real, uh, if why do we... I mean, if our experiences are momentary, why do we have recurring um, tendencies in our personalities? Well, one isn't really related to the other. It's like saying if, if a tree as an entity doesn't exist, why does it produce seeds that look like it? Or maybe I'm misunderstanding the concept of non-self. Non-self isn't a concept; it's a quality of experiences. Non-self is the real is part of the realization that all there is. Because, for example, I whenever I pass, I go through, uh, I go in the places where I spend my childhood. I get nostalgic and it happens all the time over the span of years and I keep thinking that that means that it's a self there and that means I have a self but yeah maybe I'm misunderstanding I mean it's changed after I, I did some meditation I, I became less nostalgic but it was only after I did meditation well, if you if you if you heat water up to hundred degrees, it becomes steam, and then it goes down and becomes water. And then, uh, if you heat it another time to hundred degrees, it will again become steam. Just because that pattern repeats, you can you say that the water has a soul or a self? Repeating pattern is not a not evidence for or not a good reason for taking something as a self. Also, like uh, Bhante mentioned, uh, when you plant, when you have a mango tree and I mean, it gives uh, fruits and when you plant one of those seeds, they will also give new mango trees and 
the new mango tree uh, the fruits of the new mango tree taste like mango as well but does it mean there is a soul so some uh, someone asked a question i did answer it but you may not have heard the answer yeah we yeah, didn't hear you answer about that we didn't yeah i noticed that uh, you are answering and uh, in the middle of answer the answer stopped what was the question again it was about the self oh yeah non self is uh, not a concept it's a quality of experience experiences are unstable and controllable and satisfying if i may i have um another question um on line 29 um about moreover by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception a true man enters and abides in the cessation of perception and feeling and his taints are destroyed by his seeing with wisdom this bhikkhu does not conceive anything at all he does not conceive in regard to anything he does not conceive in any way so my question is about the the practicality of that what what would one now do is that in relation to their meditation practice um what is their experience of life now and how do they how do they navigate the 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 human condition from there well mostly how we think we all navigate the human condition we think we all do things rationally and reasonably but we don't and that's what this person comes to see when they come to let go of all those irrational unreasonable behaviors so at that point it's they they sort of must be a, a monk at that point i mean of course in the context of the sutta it's be addressed to a monk um because they have to they they would have to sort of abide so simply in their life in order to sort of not be wound up in all the other things that well that's not the right way of putting it they just wouldn't ever get wound up and so they would be um they would either die because they had no interest in continuing their life or they would yeah live as a monk but they didn't they don't have to do anything i mean yeah i mean i'm just mincing words but just to be clear it's not about avoiding anything it's just yeah they just wouldn't so their life would become quite simple which some of them would just which, pass away peacefully um so naturally their life would become very peaceful and harmonious because they just well not that's maybe going too far because you can't control external things they could still be surrounded by chaos their mind would become of course completely peaceful and free from any upset their mind would be harmonious sure doesn't always correlate with the external world mm -hmm. okay thank there you there is some idea that also that the attainment can trigger a ripening of old karmas as well so terrible things can happen as a result if someone has has that in store for them it can all it some some things can be triggered and happen early so outward things can be unpleasant but it's not displeasing because there's no displeasure i mean the the opposite is true it's, it's just a matter of one's karma someone can become of course very famous and loved and world renowned because of their attainments depends on their karma and then so someone with this quality of experience would likely um be able to 
uh, liberate a lot of their karma as it comes up because they're not going to act on those previous tendencies since they're so, um, because of their immense mindfulness or stillness. Yeah, some karma may become uh, defunct. So it just doesn't have the power, doesn't have the opportunity to to bring fruit because of one's attainment. And some might ripen quickly. Um, but most importantly, I think, is what you're getting at is that, and, and it's not so much that they liberate themselves from karma, but the thing about karma is the results of karma often entice us to perform more karma. And that's why it becomes habitual. So you break the cycle. When you were angry and hurt someone and they come and hurt you back, you don't retaliate. So you end the chain. You, you don't perform further karma. Thank you, Bhante. Um... Bhante, you said, you said a while ago that uh, fear is most likely based on uh, anger. I, that. I may have misspoke because fear is based on anger, based on patika. Aversion. It's not. It's not a mostly. Why? Why, why did you say that? Well, I, I could. I could shirk responsibility and say that that's because that's what the texts say. But I, it's a funny question because we had. I had this argument with a Thai man who was adamant that fear was delusion based. I said that, that doesn't sound right. Uh, it it seems like it would be anger based, and he said, "No, no, it's delusion based." And we couldn't convince each other. And uh, then I found it in the text. I looked it up and found a, a sub commentary. So not the actual Buddha's words, but a sub commentary says uh, it is patika upada vis patika upada vis vasena or something like that. It, it's comes about through the arising of aversion. So, I mean, it, it immediately strikes me, struck me at the time that it would have to be based on anger, but the texts affirmed it. Because you don't, you aren't afraid of something that you don't dislike. Yeah. Yeah, disliking comes in the form of fear when the uh, object is uh, something you cannot overcome, like if if you are confronted with a tiger, some somebody more powerful than you, then it becomes fear. You dislike uh, the confrontation, but it uh, it is uh, uh, more yeah. more likely and probably more accurately you dislike the potential results. You're thinking of being hurt, being um, de decapitated, or or decapacitated. What is it? Being uh, made vulnerable or you're experiencing pain is a common one and the thought of pain is some the thought of pain pain arises the thought of being bitten arises the thought of being poisoned arises etc and that thought you dislike the thought okay so technically it would be something like that that's what would arise in the mind Okay. And on the other hand if uh, somebody who is working under you somebody who's supposed to follow your orders is disobeying, it can cause anger because he's, he, he's not uh, uh, doing something you you like. You, he's doing something. I, I, yeah, I I, th I think I have to amend what I said because it often evolves to the point where you don't need to even think about the pain or the fear, the 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 suffering. You just begin to dislike the sight of something, like you see a spider, and there's disliking in the form of fear. Mm -hmm. I am just contemplating where my fear comes from. I mean, why? Well, you I don't have so... to. I mean, Abhidhamma will tell you these things, but you don't have to go there. It's fine to just say afraid, afraid. Just try yeah, and yeah. face the fear and learn about it yeah. and see it clearly. It doesn't matter what you label it. Oh, this is anger. Oh, this is delusion. Because they're both involved. Delusion is, of course, a big part of fear. The point is that it's unhelpful, it's pointless, yeah. it's harmful. And so facing it and just being with it will show you that. And once you teach your mind 
like teaching a baby, just make it see. And when, when you see, uh, your mind will disincline to be afraid. Why? Because it's not, it's harmful. Monte, um, I respectfully ask, um, so because fear does have from like a, a neutral standpoint, fear does serve a certain purpose. It's that's dangerous. I shouldn't go near it. So is it, is it overcoming fear entirely and just using wisdom instead to say, oh, well, that's a black widow spider. So I'm not going to be afraid of it, but I right. have I have wisdom to discern. Yeah, I mean you can go you have to be a little more accurate and say that it's not fear that tells you that something's wrong in the first place. Fear is the reaction to something being wrong and it's unnecessary. It's not helpful. I mean it's true that someone who is afraid is more likely to jump quicker away from a situation, but that's the thing. Uh, yeah, an arahant might get hurt or killed in a place where someone who is afraid wouldn't because of the adrenaline. And that being said, there is a certain amount of adrenaline that can come without fear, I think. You just don't need the anger and the delusion. Yeah, right, even an arahant could quickly move if necessary. I feel, I feel like the arahant would have, uh, they're just so mindful that they'd be so keenly aware of what's going on that it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise them, I guess. Yeah, and it wouldn't scare them and they wouldn't be afraid of dying. And Arahant, of course, doesn't have any desire to continue living. Not that they have any desire to die, but they wouldn't be averse to being to, to dying. I agree, Vante. And also identifying uh danger or being alerted to danger comes from a quality called otap. It's not uh, disliking or fear. That's different. It's a part of wisdom. And because fear is just naturally, uh, it just doesn't feel good. That's sort of the the bottom line of it. So it's replacing something that feels good. Yeah, for for example, if you if you see a, a tiger running at you, instead of hiding, you might freeze because you are too afraid to do anything. Instead of uh, hiding and avoiding the tiger, so if you are not if you are not afraid and you identify there's a danger coming at you, you can hide or avoid the situation. Yeah, if you want to go deeper with that, doesn't feel good thing. It's it's useful to think of well, um, in to get technical, um, you're you're basically doing something to avoid suffering and to be happy, but in fact, the thing that you're doing is making you unhappy. That's what that, that so philosophically or logically, that's why it makes sense to try and free yourself from suffering. I mean, that's why this the freedom from suffering makes a good ultimate goal is because it frees you from contradiction or hypocrisy not hypocrisy but going against your own interests doing something that doesn't lead where you think it's leading that's that's how suffering works why is suffering something ultimate and, and an ultimate goal to be free from because it works that way you you don't want to suffer and yet you do things that cause you suffering so you have this internal contradiction thinking that fear is somehow going to help you and if you look closely, you see, well, wait, I'm suffering as soon as I'm afraid. What good is that? I've defeated my own purpose. It's, it's quite literally that cycle of, um, maybe that's a, like a micro example of samsara. Um, I'm not sure if that's the correct term to give it. But yeah, um, that makes complete sense. It's called the ignoble search. Anarya pariyajan. Like uh, being subject to suffering, you still go after things that are subjected to impermanent sufferings. And so, in a way, um, a lot of the teachings, perhaps uh, a core or the heart of the teachings, is uh, transmuting negative states 
into positive ones that achieve um, similar, if not better, results. So again, for example, with fear, fear is transmuted into, I'm not sure if there's an actual word for like a higher, like the transmuted version of fear, but you could just say like fear turns into wise attention or something like that. And so not only does that not... You've gone too far. I think that's going too far. Uh, do you do you practice meditation? Yes, Bhante. Are you doing the are you doing the at home course? Um, you practice some more tradition. Um, I frankly i I sort of just I do sit quietly all the time, and I'll still my mind, and I do walking meditation. So. I'd say I'd say yes. I do I do try to follow it. Well, you might get results. You might be able to see see things more like this. Um, you can only go so far by intellectualizing or philosophizing um, by talking about these things. So you might benefit from doing a, a actual formal course. Just a suggestion. Thank you, Bhante. But, uh, yeah, the, there's the transmuting is kind of uh, it's a bit, bit going a little too far. 